So, push that down a little bit. Okay, so I wanted to point out some things. I'm not sure if those of you who are in the extended section and are watching this on YouTube can see the syllabus, but if you want to pull it up and just look at it so you can follow along with where we are at, um, where we are. Uh, so we were supposed to do global consumers. We did that and then talk about segmenting, targeting, and positioning. I put a whole week in for that. Luckily, um, since we got a little bit behind because of the snowstorm and COVID and the late openings and all of that, we can get caught up to that and finish segmenting, targeting, and positioning fairly quickly, which means that next, next Tuesday we'll talk about new products and then you can start the second exam next Thursday and you'll have a week to complete that like you had a week to complete uh, the last one. I think that's what I said in the video. So we'll have covered all the content um, by Tuesday. You'll have Thursday, which means we won't have an actual class meeting that day. You have that time to work on your exam. And I also have the first critical thinking assignment uh, for you that I wanted to point out, which is if you go to D2L, um, after this module, there is a, an assignment posted. Um, can't really see that. Let me see if I can zoom in the page. But under, if you go to, for example, we'll view it as a student. If you go to assessments and then assignments, there's one called organizational behavior um, challenge. And basically, if you watch the videos, you know that I talked about the fact that consumer behavior is largely predicated on what we might call the rational actor model, and that that model has been debunked by a lot of people. I mean, a lot of psychologists would say that we don't really act very rationally. There's this antithetical model, right? And if you watch the video, I talk about the fact that maybe there's a synthesis model, or uh, you know, there's a thesis, which is we have this rational actor model. Um, then the antithesis, which is we're not so rational, and then the synthesis, which is when we have big purchases like houses and cars, maybe we're more rational than we are when we're purchasing something like I'm hungry and I need something for lunch. And so I run over to the food court and I make the worst possible choice you know, ever and buy Chick-fil-A, which is a tool of the devil. Um, so this challenge asks you, you'll have a week to complete it from today. This asks you to argue that businesses are either more or less rational than individuals. Now, I will tell you that because of the derived demand aspect of the business to business marketing, the easy thing to argue in your, in your little five paragraph essay with three examples is that businesses are more rational because they're not buying stuff because they want it. They're not buying stuff because, you know, they, they, they love it or they view it as their precious. I like clothes and I like jewelry and I spend astronomical amounts of money on both of those things. And that's not rational, right? It's just emotive. I just like it. I like, I like clothes. I like to, to dress differently than everybody else. In fact, I, I there's a little competition going. There was another professor here who dressed nicely, but my thing was for years and years and years, I have worn bow ties, French cuff shirts, and Allen Edmund shoes. That's my thing. That's my sort of style. When he got promoted to be assistant dean, he started wearing bow ties, French cuff shirts, and Allen Edmund shoes. And I'm like, what is this? You're stealing my, my style, right? And he's like, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. And I'm like, no, that's called brand dilution. I'm a marketer, right? You're diluting my brand. So I had to go and figure out, so I could come up with new ties, right, all the time. And that's the way I, I continue to, to stand out. But I like clothes, I like jewelry, I spend them. That's not rational. Nobody needs all the clothes. And I have something like 200 French cuff shirts, right? I, I just, I, I see them and I buy them and I, I, that's not rational. Businesses should be more rational. That's the easy case to make. The, the case that will probably, and you can get bonus points for exceptional answers to that critical thinking challenge is gonna be that businesses are just as irrational as people. Right? 
they're just as irrational. So I just throw that out there for you. That'll be due a week from today when you start your um, second exam, then you have a week to complete that. So any questions on the critical thinking challenge, you can find it under the assignment tab, organizational behavior, five paragraph essay. Um, consider all three types, profit, which is things like Ford Motor, not for profit, which are things like the Red Cross, and then governmental entities. When we talk about business to business or organizational marketing, we're talking about all three of those, governmental entities, nonprofits, and um, profit organizations. So General Motors, things like Red Cross, um, and then uh, governmental entities, things like the city of Guthrie, things like the city of Edmond, right? Those are all those types of entities. Um, again, for those of you that are in the extended section watching on YouTube, if you want to get points, I said this last time, um, I'll put it up here again. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Um, text to 405-414-7054 if you have questions or comments. I give people in the class these ducks if they have questions or comments or participate in the class participation. Those are bonus points that are added to your um, next exam. All right? So that'll be the second exam. So we need to talk about segmenting, targeting, and positioning today. So for most of human history, if we went back if you go back to my early lectures that I sent you on video and talking about the marketing philosophies and the eras of marketing. So these marketing philosophies tend to correspond, as you may recall, I'm sure this is redundant for those of you who watch the videos, but redundancy and, and reinforcement is a good thing. I'm a lawyer. We like redundancy. We put the same thing in, in contracts over and over and over again to emphasize our points, make sure that you really know what you're getting. Right. Um, for most of human history, we, we focused on or we relied on the production model, which was just goods were so scarce until very recently. And in many parts of the world, they still are so scarce that if you produced something, people would buy it if it was at all useful. If you had any, you know, um, skill whatsoever, if you could make things, if you could make shirts, if you could make um, jackets, people would buy them because there was not a lot of alternatives, right? There, they didn't have mass production um, until the latter part of, uh, of the um, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, which was not that long ago. I know for most of you that that seems like ancient history. But it wasn't, you know, in terms of human development and evolution, that was not that, that long ago. Then we get the Industrial Revolution and we start producing stuff. We start mass producing goods. And the idea is that because most people are pretty homogenous, we can mass produce goods and we can just make a few varieties of things. So if you think about what do clothing sizes come in? Well, historically, if you went to buy a sweatshirt, when I was a kid growing up, there were three basic sizes of sweatshirts. There was small, medium, and large. As food production in the United States, and food is cheap here compared to other places, and as we have stopped cooking at home and we've stopped maybe being as active as we once were, because when I was a kid, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm the first generation to have grown up with like video games and things like that. We started playing inside more. Although my generation still, you know, we, we rode our bikes and we did things outside. Um, people have become larger. And so now we've started adding sizes to that sort of basic taxonomy of small, medium, large. Now you've got extra large and extra, extra large. And, and so forth. But that was, you know, there's just sort of like small, medium, and large. Unless you were getting something like a, a fine suit that was custom made, you know, you've got small, medium, and large. Lots of things still come in these sizes. Sweatpants, for example, still, you know, small, medium, and large. And I tell you, there's a size range in there 
Um, but the idea was that we could pretty much produce things for a homogenous society. Then once more competition begins to enter into the field, people start demanding differentiation. And differentiation may be the most important word in marketing today. Um, differentiation among goods is taken now to the extreme. Everything is differentiated. Again, going back to my childhood, I'm sure that to all of you, I mean, I, I know that I, that, that, I, that I seem older now than I did because I can tell by the looks on students' faces. When I started teaching here and I was 22, the average age of our freshmen here was 29 because we were non-traditional school. And so I was much younger than most of the people that I was teaching which led to some problems because they would say things like, well, that's an interesting theory, but that's not the way it works in the real world. Okay. At 25, I became vice mayor of the city of Guthrie. I was teaching political science at that time. And so I could say, you know, I've sort of run a campaign. I've been a candidate for office and yeah, this is the way it works in the real world. So, um, you know, I, I had that problem. Now I notice that students, you know, look at me like, wow, you're, you're ancient, you're old, you're 50. Um, but it's not been that long ago. I mean, that, that, you know, I was growing up as a child of the, of the eighties and nineties. And when, again, when I would go to the grocery store as a kid, there were basically two types of milk. There was whole milk and there was skim milk. That was it. Two types of milk on the shelf. Whole milk and skim milk. And skim milk was awful. I wouldn't drink it. Right? But that was it. Now what do we have when we go to the store? Well, there's not just skim milk. There's 1% milk. And there's 2% milk. And they actually make, you know, when I was a kid, they didn't make chocolate milk in bottles that they, you know, put out at the store. You bought this Nestle quick powder stuff and you made your own chocolate. I mean, the, the height of now they've got chocolate milk and they've got strawberry milk and they've got milk that isn't milk. But they call it milk. It's not milk. They call it soy milk. You know why I know it's not milk? because soybeans don't lactate, right? But they call it soy milk. And there have actually been cases in other countries where they've tried to stop, farmers have tried to stop because in other places, they think that you have to have, a, you know, things have to mean what they say and say what they mean. And soy milk is not milk, it's soy juice. But that doesn't sound appealing, does it? doesn't sound good for a marketing person. Soy juice, have some soy juice on your cereal. That just doesn't sound good. There's almond milk. Again, almonds don't lactate. So it's not really milk, it's almond juice. And it's really not very much almond juice because almonds, you, you can't juice them. You know what, they, they crush them, they powderize them. And you know how many almonds are actually in a gallon of almond milk? A small child could hold the number of almonds and a gallon of almond milk in their hand. It's mostly water. The almonds are just pretty much for the flavoring and thickener. That's in that. It's mostly water and thickener. But they call it milk. So we've got almond milk and soy milk, 2% milk, 1% milk, skim milk, whole milk, chocolate milk, strawberry milk. Right, all of these, these, these variations, because there's a there's a demand now for this. Again, if you went back pre my era, pre my generation, um, you didn't get skim milk either. You know, milk was brought to you when my mother was a kid growing up. They still had milkmen that delivered milk, and they just delivered whole milk in bottles. That was it. That's what you got. Whole milk. You know, 
know, that, that was all there was. We started to, because we have so many choices now, we've started to demand more differentiation. That means that we have to break people up into segments. So we can no longer think of the United States as this homogenous society that all need the same thing. There are very few things, very few products out there that we all need. Maybe the COVID vaccine is something that we all need, although the anti-vaxxers are going to say that we shouldn't be taking it, right? But it's a safe vaccine. I think you should take the vaccine. You know, when you're when you're eligible to take the vaccine, it will help us get away from having to wear these stupid masks um, quickly. Uh, maybe that's one example of something that we all need, and maybe the whole world needs the COVID vaccine. I think that's probably a, a true statement. Um, but there are very few products like that, right? And even that will become more and more differentiated, I suspect, as time goes on. So, for example, one of the things that happens, my, my cousin is a nurse. She is required every year to get the flu vaccine. The flu is generally an avian flu. That's, that's the most common types of flu or avian flus. So they make the flu vaccine out of eggs. She's allergic to eggs. So they have come up with a, if you are allergic to eggs and you would go into anaphylactic shock because they give you the shot, they've come up with an alternative to that. There are people who seem to be sensitive to not very many and they haven't died. They have a, they have a reaction to the, uh, the vaccine. There is a solution to that. They give you epinephrine and, and you're, you're fine. But, you know, they'll come up with, with alternatives there johnson and johnson has now got a one-shot vaccine that's going through uh through probably the emergency use authorization and will be available very shortly so there will be a demand for that there will be people who don't want to go get two shots right so we're already seeing differentiation in that market and that you know two shots are really it's really inconvenient my mother got her first shot She's been trying to get the second one. Then we had this horrible, she had it lined up. She had an appointment at the Logan County Health Department to get her second shot. And we had the snowstorm and everything was shut. They shut down the, the uh, COVID clinic. So she hasn't gotten her second shot. One shot's better than two. It's less effective, only 75% effective, but that's better than nothing, right? I, I would be willing to settle for that probably. So we'll start to see differentiation. So. How do we segment people? Well, we aggregate consumers into groups that one, have common needs, and two, will respond similarly to marketing action. So there's a, as I look out at the people that are live in class today, there's somewhat of a variance in you, although you seem to be somewhat of a more homo uh, homogeneic group than maybe I normally have in that everybody in front of me today is a female. Right? You're all about the same age. Um, but you probably have different likes and desires, but what's one thing that you all have a similar need for? Well, it's a, a textbook for principles of marketing that's required for this class. That's, you know, one thing that makes you similar. So you are a marketing segment that would respond to have common needs and will respond to similarly um, pitched marketing actions. Marketing segments are homogeneous groups of prospective buyers that result from market segmentation process. So we're going to aggregate consumers, we're going to break down the market into these various segments, then we're going to um, put them into these, uh, these various segments, and that's um, what we get, these various marketing segments as a result of that. And then we're going to use product differentiation through the marketing mix to help consumers perceive that our products are better or superior to our competitors and that they are what you need. Right? So we're going to then differentiate products. And again, differentiation may be the most important word in marketing today. And it's one of these things that I try to make it relevant to you. You should think about how you, as you are going to go out into the workforce shortly, because if you're taking this class, I think you have to at least be a sophomore. And this is a 3000 level class. You're probably a business student. We have very few students that are not um, business students that take our classes. It's 3000 level class. This means you're getting close to that, you know, end of uh, the road 
period of your baccalaureate education, you start thinking about these things. How are you as a product, thinking of yourself as a product, going to differentiate yourself to a prospective employer? Right? What are you going to do? What skills do you have that make you attractive to that prospective employer? So how can we segment? How to segment markets? You can have one product and multiple segments. So for example, magazines and newspapers um, do this. The Daily Oklahoman, I don't know if they still do this because I don't take the Daily Oklahoman anymore, but when I used to take the Daily Oklahoman, I live in Guthrie, which is the most northern city in the SMSA, which is Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area, which I think they now just abbreviate as MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area. So Oklahoma City Metroplex is a conglomeration of multiple cities that have all sort of grown together. At one point in time, they were sort of distinct and unique and maybe separate from each other, but it's really hard to tell now where one begins and the other ends, right? If you're going through, for example, um, Edmond, how do you know where you're in North Oklahoma City versus Edmond? Sort of a general rule of the dividing line there is Memorial Road, but there are exceptions. There are places where Oklahoma City is actually further north of Memorial um, than, than you would think, and, and you know Edmond is a, maybe a little bit south. Uh, or more number. Um, those school districts don't totally overlap well. Edmond schools, there are places that are in Oklahoma City that are in Edmond Public Schools. Um, and by the way, the houses in that area of south uh, of North Oklahoma City, the houses, like if you go across the street, there's a radical difference in price because one side of the street may be in Oklahoma City Public Schools and the other side may be in Edmond. So you get these, these differences. So it's hard to tell, right? Um, it's particularly if you go beyond Edmond into places like um, Nichols Hills, it's very difficult to tell when you're in Nichols Hills or the village as opposed to Oklahoma City, unless you look at the street signs that where they actually say the village on them. It's, it's hard to tell, right? It's, it's all just kind of Oklahoma City. Um, but there are different parts of the city with different sort of demographic groups and the daily oklahoman when i used to subscribe to it knew it and so there was a north side edition for the daily oklahoman that basically covered guthrie edmund and northwest oklahoma city right there was a south oklahoma city edition that covered things that were happening in, in south oklahoma city um there was a western edition I think that was, you know, for largely people who were in the Oklahoma City Metroplex it goes now all the way. It didn't used to when I was a kid growing up. It didn't actually go all the way to El Reno, but it now is technically El Reno is included in what they consider the MSA. Um, it used to just stop sort of at Yukon, um, but now it goes to El Reno. So there was a, a Western edition that covered that. But then the vast majority of the paper is covering all the same stuff. It's covering national news, state news, and then it just had this sort of local section to it that, that, they, that they inserted. It was sort of an insert in the paper. Um, you can have multiple products for multiple segments. So for example, um, in cars, right? We don't have just one car and try to market it to different types of, of uh, um, segments all, all with the same car. Um, you've got cars, SUVs, trucks, crossovers, hybrids, um, fully electric vehicles, right? Those all appeal to multiple segments and those are all multiple products. And then you can have mass customization, which is things like Dell. Forever, that is a Dell computer that the school has given me to teach this class um, and use it for my uh, YouTube live to go, go live um, in this class. You used to buy Dell by calling or going online and ordering the Dell computer. You couldn't just go to the store and buy the Dell. Did you go to the store? I didn't buy this, obviously. Did you go to the store? Did you go online and order it? 
It was cheaper online. Did you mass customize it though? Um, I don't know if I dabbed the computer, so I think I can do that. I'll see. Okay. So he may have like actually Dell is mass is mass customization. This is what we call value co-creation, in that you could go online, you could get the processor that you wanted, you know, the, the very high speed processor, sort of the mid-range or the low range processor. You could get the storage capacity that you wanted, and then you could get the suite of um of software programs which we now just use apps for um loaded onto your dell that's the way dell dell operated and then they would build the computer for you and ship it out to you um very shortly and you would get it within a within a record-breaking amount of time m ms does something similar i think in one of the videos i i did you watch a video where i did the my m ms did i show you the my m ms the mass customization in one of the videos that's an example of mass customization right you can now Order your M&Ms in all these different colors that you want, and the different packaging that you want. You can put your 3D picture on it for your special events, which you know the old pinched faces never look quite quite right. But if that's what you want, um, you can you can do that. So you can have mass customization um, in the segmentation, which allows for even segments down to the individual level. So how do you go about segmenting? How do you segment people into different groups? How do you find these groups? So there are different ways that you can segment buyers um, in the market. And the criteria that you're gonna to use to segment are going to be based on things like simplicity and cost effectiveness. If you are a small to mid-sized business. So my family owns a small business in Guthrie. We've owned it since 1986. And most businesses like ours, and until I became a marketing professor, they didn't, you know, my mother didn't have, my mother has some idea for marketing. She was an English teacher. She read some books. She has owned successive businesses. And so she's sort of self-taught, but she didn't have a marketing expert in, in the kitchen that could help her. Um, so you segment very simply, right? Um, at that level, usually. So how do you do that? You're gonna look at what's cost effective. How can you segment? Well, most small businesses like my mother's can't afford to hire a marketing firm to go out and do market research right so you're just going to have to sort of segment uh, the market into what you think people want right not everybody wants to so the business that we have is the stone line Inn. it was the first bed and breakfast in oklahoma um, when we started in 1986 people didn't know what a bed and breakfast was they would come and show up at the door and they'd say well this is a house and my mother would say, yes, that's what a bed and breakfast is. You're staying in somebody's lovely house. And they'd say, I don't want to stay in a house. And we were remarkably unsuccessful to begin with. So she started looking for some way to pitch our bed and breakfast that people would, in Oklahoma would come to. And she started writing. She was an English teacher. She started writing murder mystery parties. And we started hosting murder mystery parties. And that's, and so... We evolved from being a bed and breakfast, from being a lodging establishment, to the segment that we were appealing to was, at that point in time, sort of yuppies that were looking for a new experience, something different to do, right? Rather than just have your regular old date night go out, have, um, you know, movie or dinner and a movie, um, something else. So, you know, she, she sort of backed into the segment that would be attracted to, to that. So... Simplicity and cost effectiveness. What is the potential to increase your ROI? You can segment the market down to this individual level, but unless you're Dell or M&Ms and you have this capability of doing this, is that cost effective, right, to, to do that? Probably for lots of businesses, it's not. So is it going to actually increase your return on investment? So this is a criteria to consider. The similarity of the needs of potential buyers. Although we're all sort of different, are there enough similarities that you don't need to break down the market segments as much as you think you do? Um, the different needs among the different segments, identifying those, and then the potential for marketing action to reach a segment. There's no good to segment beyond the point at which you can achieve a, a, a result, right? So is there a potential for you to reach a certain segment? When I was in the corporate world, I was an executive vice president for the American Education Corporation, we built learning management systems for K-12, right? And so there are all different kinds of school districts out there with all different kinds of needs. 
based on you know the type of kids that they have. Do those kids show up, in the words of the first President Bush, ready to learn? What kinds of school districts have kids that show up ready to learn? Well, you're sitting in the middle of a district that has kids that show up ready to learn. Edmond is one of the highest, although it has fallen, uh, according to Forbes' most recent ranking, as the highest per capita household income in the state. It has now been beaten out again by Nichols Hills. There's sort of a, an ongoing um, battle between the two as to which has the higher. But Edmond, by and large, on the whole, is a high income producing uh, school district. The average um, house in Edmond is something like $325,000 now, right? Whereas the average house price across the state of Oklahoma is right around $125,000. So it's considerably, <clears throat> it's considerably more in Edmond. We know that students who have parents with high access to resources, generally, in the words of the first President Bush, show up ready to learn. Why? Because their parents start at an early age planning and worrying about these things and getting their kids you know, involved. They hire nannies who have they're not just babysitters, <clears throat> they hire nannies who have degrees in early childhood development. You know, things like you need to read to the kid and what kinds of activities are going to be stimulating, right? I mean, they, they show up ready to learn. That's a very different district than, according to Forbes, the poorest city in our state is Hugo. How many of you know where Hugo is? Anybody know where Hugo is? Anybody know what Hugo's famous for? They have a lot of um, carnivals uh, that winter in Hugo. Um, so they used to, the, the big top tent performers and elephants and stuff like that used to winter. And they have a um, circus, uh, a circus um, graveyard there. Um, they also have a rodeo graveyard for, for rodeo. Uh, Lane Frost, who's a very famous rodeo. Uh, athlete is, is buried in Hugo. It's the poorest. I think, according to Forbes, the average household income in Hugo is something like $34,000. Right? That's the average. The median, which is actually maybe a more useful statistic, is $25,000 in Hugo. That's radically different than the median household income in Edmond which is uh, approaching um, $225,000, according to Forbes. Right? And that's a radically different system. So what those kids need in school districts like Hugo is different than the products that we sold to school districts like Edmond, where what they wanted was they wanted all kinds of foreign language software in the, in the suite. They wanted... Um, advanced mathematics, right? Um, advanced calculus and uh, trigonometry and things like that in our uh, learning management. So, um, so the potential to reach different segments, and we could do that. Um, we could we could provide school districts with that. But there were school districts that were so far out of our league that we didn't compete. There were there were other learning management systems that had far more to offer than we could with the uh, amount of, of you know, social scientists and curriculum developers that we had on our staff. So ways to segment. There are easy ways and more difficult ways. Um, demographics is generally one of the easiest ways to sort of segment in, in the process. Again, taking my family's business experience as an example, one of the things that we did, and you don't want every customer when you're a business. You, you know, most businesses don't want every customer. There are some customers that are too expensive to keep. So before my mother started doing the murder mysteries, before she started writing them, one of the things that they were doing that became very popular 
was there was a tour company um, that developed tours that were called Elder Hostel. And the idea was based on sort of the European model of youth hostels. And again, I was a foreign exchange student in Germany, so I stayed in a number of these youth hostels. We traveled, the, the boy and the family that I lived with, and I took, um, the family bought a second car. That was a big deal. The mother had never had a car, and she let us take the car and go to Barbaria and do some touring, and we, you know, we we're poor. And so we stayed in these youth hostels, which are basically Um, they're, they're like dormitories. I mean, if I'm being nice, you, you stay in a room with a lot of people, there's no private bath. Um, there's not a lot of privacy, but it's cheap, you know, like at the time, um, Germany was still using the Deutsche Mark. Um, there were four marks to a dollar. And at most of the youth hostels that we stayed at, you could stay at them overnight for like 10 marks. Right. I mean, that, so it was. Um, you can do the math, that's, that's very cheap compared to staying at a hotel or a bed and breakfast or something like that, which would have been you know, 50 or 60 marks or more. So um, this company puts together these ideas that, that they're going to have these elder hostels, which will be you know providing educational, learning, touring experiences for the, for the elderly. And we got on um, with this company to do tours because they would come to Guthrie. Guthrie is the original capital of the state of Oklahoma. Um, we were the territorial capital of the state, or the territory of Oklahoma, um, beginning in April 22nd, 1889, when we had the, the land run. So there's a lot of history in Guthrie. And Guthrie has more historic homes and buildings on the National Register of Historic Places than any other city per capita in America. I mean, it's just enormously historic, right? It's a, it's a great town. So these, these Tour groups would come and they would put their guests up at our bed and breakfast. And we rapidly realized that, and this is segmenting by demographic, which is ethnicity, age, gender, income, that that was a demographic we couldn't serve very well. Because old people are demanding. They have mobility issues. Our bed and breakfast is in a home that was built in 1907. There's no elevator, right? I mean, if you can't get up the stairs, you're going to have a problem. It's a historic property. Um, and so we rapidly realized we started referring to them not as elder hostel, but uh, sort of lovingly as hostile elders. Because, you know, they would show, and they had all these needs. They were demanding. And that was, so we started segmenting by, by age, right? You know, I mean, we, we are not going to appeal to people who are in that age group, necessarily. Um, so demographics is very easy. Geographic is very easy to segment by. It may be less useful. The easier it is to do, the less useful it may be. But it still can be somewhat useful in my geographic segmentation. Um, I did my PhD. I'm originally from New Mexico, and I went back to New Mexico to get my PhD. I did most of my education here. I started at OU. I got a master's here at UCO, my Juris Doctorate from Oklahoma City University, and then I went back to New Mexico to get my PhD at New Mexico State, which is in beautiful Las Cruces, New Mexico. At the time I was in Las Cruces doing my PhD, they did a study of uh, fifth graders in um, Las Cruces, and they asked them, where are you most likely to see a boat? This was something that was interesting to me because I have a boat. I've had lots of boats. And the number one answer among fifth graders in Las Cruces, New Mexico, is that you're most likely to see a boat on the highway. Why is that? Where is Las Cruces, New Mexico located? It's what? Yeah, they're going, there's no water in Las Cruces. It's a desert. It's in the middle of a desert. It's, and so the only time they see a boat, and the Rio Grande, by the time it gets to Las Cruces, is not so grand. It's been, um, they, they, have, uh, they have sort of drained most of it for irrigation upstream, and so it's really not a very grand river. It was never, even, even back before they started irrigating things, it was never really all that grand. But the closest lake 
was about 90 miles away at Elephant View, which is sort of in the center of the state. That's a, a damming of the Rio Grande where they, they have created a reservoir. So they, they've never seen a boat. You know, like if you ask a kid in Oklahoma the same question, where are they going to say you're most likely to see a boat? Well, it's going to be on a lake, right? Because we have lots of lakes in Oklahoma. If you ask a kid in South Texas where they're most likely to see a boat, they're going to say what? In the ocean, right? Or in the Gulf of Mexico. That's where that's where they're most likely to see a boat. Given that, if you go to the Yamaha dealer, so one of the things I have is I have a Yamaha Wave Runner. That's a personal watercraft. If you go to the Yamaha dealer in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, they have zero Wave Runners on display. They will order them for you, but they have zero Wave Runners on display. If you go to the Yamaha dealer in Oklahoma City, they have lots of Wave Runners on display, right? They have lots of them. What do they have in Las Cruces, New Mexico? They have side by sides. They have quads at the at the Yamaha dealer. So that's a geographic segmentation. More, okay. So this is easy, easy. This is harder. Doing psychographics using values, um, the values, attitudes, and lifestyles to really get into what it is that people want. These are highly targeted, right? The way they the way they build video games now are used. They use uh, psychographic segmentation. Um, they know with a, a great deal of detail who the average player is that plays Fortnite. I got I played one game of Fortnite with my nephew, and the next time I was like, Carson, do you want to play? And he's already moved on. Right? And Fortnite's no longer cool. That's that was yesterday. And that was like two weeks ago, Uncle Grant. Don't you know anything? He's on to uh, Call of Duty or you know, some other some game. But um and then behavioral usage rates uh, is another way that we can segment. How often do people use them? Are they a high uh, user, utilizer of our services or products, or are they sort of a mid or, or every once in a while, an occasional user? So the groups, we can group products to be sold into categories, um, once we segment um, and lay out the store. Uh, we're in retail, for example, uh, based on that so that we make things easier um, for people's size. We can develop marketing grids and estimate the size of the markets that we want to reach. So we can put markets on horizontal rows and then products on vertical columns. And then we can estimate the size um, for each cell that we develop in, in the segment that we're going to that we're going to target. How much are we going to get out of it? I won't do that because I did the organizational behavior challenge for you guys. So we'll skip that. Targeting. So once we've broken the, the market down into these segments, we then have to select the targets that we want to uh, appeal to. Again, we learned very early on in our business that sort of the group that we appealed to were, um, at that point in time, they were called yuppies, right? Young, upwardly mobile professional people. That's who we. Uh, that's who we targeted to. Our demographic, by the way, has changed um, as a result because the people who would be, that's your generation no longer likes that term, yuppies. Um, they think it's a pejorative term. Um, but the people that are sort of the same young, upwardly mobile urban professionals, they want more visual stimulation and things like that. And so our, our demographic has actually changed. Some of it has gotten older. Um, in terms of the, the markets that we appeal to. So when we select those target segments, we have to think about the market size. Is there a big enough size to go after that, that segment? Um, is there enough people there? Is there growth or expected growth potential? Do we have a competitive position in the market? Again, thinking about my own business or my family's business, um, when we started, we were the first bed and breakfast in Oklahoma. You don't necessarily want to be the first anything, right? It can be very scary, but we were the first. Bed and breakfast then became very popular. Lots of people started going to bed and breakfast. It became, you know, people went to Eureka Springs and they experienced it. And at one point in time, there was something like 37 bed and breakfasts that popped up in, in Guthrie. We're now down to maybe three or four, right, um, that, that, that have survived. And we've been in business for almost 40 years now. Um, so 
you know, what's our competitive position in that market? Well, it went from we were the only ones to all of a sudden there was a whole lot of them, but we were the best known because we were the first um, to now, again, where there's not very many. If you want to do bed and breakfast in Oklahoma, there's just not, a, there's a whole lot. If you go to Arkansas, to your Springs or Hot Springs, Arkansas, um, but there's just not a whole lot in Oklahoma, so if that's what you want, we have somewhat of a competitive uh, advantage. What is the cost of reaching the segments? Anymore, because of the internet, a lot of costs have become extraordinarily decreased, with the exception of one demographic group, which is the elderly, right? They're the least likely to have access to internet or, or know how to use it. When we look at those segments, what is the compatibility within our organizational objectives and resources? And then we need to take marketing action using the marketing mix to uh, to approach those segments that we identify those are those that we want to target. Which leads us to positioning. Product positioning is the placement of products in such a way as they develop an image in the mind of the consumer. Developing that image in the mind of the consumer. What is it that we want the consumer to think about our product? And when we talk about integrated marketing communication, we'll talk more about this, about how we go about doing this, about how we position. But basically, positioning is staking out that ground in the market and getting the consumer to identify with that position. Since I used to teach political marketing, I will use that as an example. So I used to teach a class called political marketing. Um, there hasn't been a lot of demand for that, and I really wish there were because I loved teaching that class. It was one of my favorite classes, but we have become largely a sales program. And I love the sales program, um, but I also love political marketing. So um, in the political marketplace, we have ideologies that span a political spectrum from extreme left to extreme right. And on the extreme left of the political spectrum, you have communism. On the extreme right, you have fascism. In the United States, we have a tendency to have two parties historically until Donald Trump um, that operated pretty much in the middle of the spectrum, right? We, there were not a lot of communists you could go back to the 1940s and 50s and you could find some people, particularly intellectuals, that were attracted to the idea of communism and that, that identified as communists. They were blacklisted as a result of that in, in many instances. They couldn't find jobs. It became difficult. Um, by the way, there is evidence to suggest that the father of the atomic weapon, which was developed in my home state of northern New Mexico, and my home state of New Mexico was developed in northern New Mexico at Los Alamos National Laboratories by a man, a physicist named Robert Oppenheimer. Um, he had at one point in time joined, and it was very, they had to, the general who was in charge of the project, Graves, had to constantly keep that under wraps, that, that he, because we were fighting an ideological war um, you know, or we could see that we were going to start fighting an ideological war with the communists, even though they were our friends in World War II. Um, so we don't have a lot of communists, we don't have a lot of fascists in this country. Um, pretty much what we fight about is, you know, over here we're going to call this the liberal and the conservative, which roughly correspond with the Democratic Party on the liberal side and the Republican Party on, on the, the right side. Most people historically in the United States, again, until very recently, have said that they're moderate, right? They, they are, they may register as Republican, but until very recently, and this has changed, people have said, I vote for the man, not the party. That, that is starting to change in, a, in an era of hyper-partisanship. But 
historically, the model suggests that what you want to do is you want to be the, the candidate that is the most centered candidate in order to win elections. Now, there are examples where we can step out of that, and Donald Trump is an extreme example of that. But the idea is that after you win the nomination, um, so there's a question uh, from one of your extended classmates. China leading the global market with communism. How is that working? Um, how is that works good communism versus bad? Um, I think what you're asking me is, is China, is, China, is China really a communist country? The Chinese Communist Party pays lip service to communism. They're not really communistic. Any country that now has um, more billionaires than are found in all of Western Europe can't really claim to be all that communistic, right? But they do, but they're really not a communist. They are more of an, I would say that they are economically um, a more free market, although they have more regulation than the United States does, um, but that they have a totalitarian system of government, right? Communism can be both a political ideology and an economic system, right? That, that's, um, that, that's sort of, pure communism is not a political ideology, it's, it's, a, it's an economic system. But politics is defined as who gets what, when, where, and how, obviously has implications if you have this system of economics that tells everybody what they get, right? So the idea is that, so for example, um, what you wanna do, is you want to run to the center after you get the nomination and capture the most votes. Now, if you're if your candidate, if your opponent is sort of say, and we'll use George W. Bush as the example, because Al Gore did exactly what he should. He won the popular vote but lost the electoral college. So George W. Bush, when he ran for president of the United States, staked out a position that was fairly conservative and fairly to the right of the middle. More right than most people would have suggested that he should have. His father, George Herbert Walker Bush, was probably, so this was GWV over here, his father was probably right here. George Herbert Walker Bush. Before George Herbert Walker Bush became Ronald Reagan's vice president, he ran against Ronald Reagan in 1980 in the primary, and he was a pro-choice candidate, right? Barry Goldwater, the father of modern conservatism, was pro-choice, by the way. The, the father of the Republican modern conservative party was pro-choice, because that's actually the conservative position. But what Al Gore did, and he was successful in winning the popular vote, was he snuggled up to George W. Bush, so Al Gore was right over here. He was, for a Democrat, he was fairly conservative. Along with Bill Clinton, they had signed NAFTA, which was viewed as very anti-union at the time. And the idea is that if you snuggle up here, you capture this entire market, right? These people over here are not going to vote for somebody that's over there. But what you've done is you've co-opted everybody that would have voted for George W. Bush from here to here. And that worked to win the popular vote. Al Gore did win the popular vote. The problem is that we don't win presidential elections based on popular vote, do we? We win, pop we win presidential elections based on electoral votes. Right, and he lost the electoral college. So he won the popular vote, and part of the reason that he did is that by taking this position, and this is, how, this is an example of how positioning is important. By taking this position, what he did was, he, these people over here didn't vote for George W. Bush. They just didn't vote. They just stayed home. And George W. Bush, motivated his people 
to go to the polls. They were pumped up. They were excited about his candidacy, and they went to the polls. The Republicans turned out in greater numbers. So George W. Bush said, I'm going to stake out this position, and I'm going to defend this position. And he won because not all votes are equal. If you don't go vote, your vote doesn't count. Now, we can apply this sort of model to business, right? Let's think about a business. Let's think about two diametrically opposed watch brands. Rolex, Timex. Rolex does not want to, Rolex is the GWB. They do not want to sell watches to everybody doing that. They don't want to sell a watch to everybody. But people who buy, and I tell you this as somebody who has a Rolex, I'm wearing it today, I have lots of watches, and Rolex is my favorite, are deeply committed to Rolex. Timex wants to sell a watch to everybody. Timex, their, their motto is it keeps a lift, it keep, takes a licking and keeps on taking at one time. They wanted to sell watches to everybody. Rolex doesn't want to sell a watch to everybody. Right? Rolex wants to sell watches to wealthy people. That's their identity. That's their brand. And so they can motivate people to do that, right? So you don't have to necessarily capture the largest percentage of the market. You just have to be able to motivate your consumers to go. Let's think about it in terms of a food restaurant group. In Oklahoma City, I don't know that there are any four-star restaurants anymore in what we might consider. So the, the rating system is a little odd anymore because we have all these different rating agencies that do things. But it used to be that, that restaurants were rated in, in um, Europe by the Michelin system, and there's three stars. It's a three-star system. Um, there were four stars, and they were rated by mobile. There was the mobile guide, which I think was the one that did. I think that's correct. Maybe you're wrong. I'll have to check. But there was a guide that rated them, and I think it was mobile, and they went up to four stars in the, in the mobile guide. Um, I don't know that Oklahoma City has. I don't know that they still do that. But if they did, I don't know that any of our restaurants would qualify for a four-star rating. Um, there was a four-star restaurant in Santa Fe called The Compound, which was extraordinarily expensive. But we have nice restaurants in Oklahoma City. In fact, one of the things that I tell people is when they're like, "Why?" why when I got my PhD and I said I wanted to move back to Oklahoma, everybody was like, why would you want to move back to Oklahoma? And I'm like, it's great. Like, you, you can get anything you want to eat in Oklahoma City that you can get in New York City, and you will not stand in line for two hours waiting. You can see any play that you wanted to see in New York City. It will come to Oklahoma City and you will not have to wait six months for tickets for it. You don't have the traffic that you have in Dallas. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a neat place. So at the top of the, uh, the Devon Tower in Oklahoma City is a restaurant called Bast, right? Very upscale, trendy, high-end restaurant. And there's also McDonald's around Oklahoma City, right? McDonald's wants to sell hamburgers to everybody. Bass doesn't want to sell hamburgers. I don't think they sell hamburgers. But they don't want to sell hamburgers to everybody. Okay? They want a certain clientele. That's the difference. The problem with McDonald's model is that what can happen if you try to get to everybody? You might satisfy none. Now, McDonald's has been really good. They're cheap, fast, consistent. That's what makes McDonald's McDonald's. But they've started to lose market share to things like Starbucks. And so if you look at the McDonald's, which comes to repositioning, which is very difficult. If you decide you need to reposition your brand because you're losing market share, McDonald's has had this experience where their breakfast segment, which is one of their most profitable segments and one of their largest segments, they started losing out to a tool of the devil called Starbucks. Starbucks, it's a horrible Horrible company, horrible product, tool of the devil. But for some reason, you people are attracted 
you have been corrupted by the devil. And you love Starbucks. And they've started cutting into McDonald's. So what has McDonald's started to do? They've started to reposition themselves. If you look at McDonald's, when I grew up, every McDonald's had a playground with a hamburger who was the 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 jail, like you climb up in it, it was the, you know, um, no, the hamburger was installed, the, the policeman, I can't remember what his name was, and Ronald McDonald, and they all had a playground or with bouncy, you know, houses and stuff like that. They don't do that anymore. If you look at the new McDonald's, they're starting to look a lot like Starbucks, and they've started to come out with their McCafe menu, which is a better upscale brand of, you know, caffeinated product that you can get in the morning to compete with it's but it's very difficult to reposition yourself once you've established that position in the market that you are the hamburger for everybody for the everyday man it's it's hard to get away from that it's hard to reposition your brand so you have to think about when you're doing this where do you want to be in the market how how sustainable is your position in the market. Donald Trump tried an extreme version of George W. Bush. He tried a more extreme version. George W. Bush managed to do it for two terms. He won two terms. Donald Trump didn't. Right? He, he, it was not sustainable over the long haul. So you have to think about that because if you have to reposition yourself, changing your position in the mind of a consuming public to be very difficult. I don't think McDonald's is going to be very successful at it. They're trying. They're trying to compete with Starbucks. Starbucks sells a lot of the same. They have a breakfast sandwich that, oddly enough, resembles a sausage McMuffin. But the idea of most people, so I have this friend, and, and he's somewhat educated. He has a, he has a bachelor's degree. Um, he should know better. But he's like, I was like, when we travel, I like to go to McDonald's because it's fast, cheap quick in and out. And he's like, let's go to Starbucks. They've just got cleaner food. I'm like, Fritz, their sausage McMuffin, which they don't call it something, but they call it a sausage sandwich or something like that. I got news for you, the sausage in no way, shape or form is clean. Whatever that means. If you ever watch sausage being made, I grew up on a farm, a cattle ranch actually, but you know, if you've ever watched processing a meat, there's very little clean about it. And if you look at the calories and the fat and the sodium in the Starbucks tool of the devil, breakfast sausage sandwich, it's got just as much fat, you know, just as much cholesterol and all of that and sodium as the McDonald's sandwich. But the perception in the mind of the consumer, even educated or people who should be educated, is that Starbucks is a superior product, right? Even though in taste tests and blind taste tests, their coffee always gets beaten by McDonald's. Always. Right? And they do that deliberately. They, they have deliberately manufactured shitty coffee so that they can upsell you into a frappuccino or a latte. So it's no longer a $5 cup of coffee. It's a $7.95 latte. Right, and they turn the text on. They it sounds better. They've got a nicer taxonomy. McDonald's, what's their? I, I, I hate Starbucks taxonomy, by the way. And I like scream at them if I have to go because somebody drags me there, and I'll say I want a medium latte. You mean a what is that called? A grande? Oh uh huh? And I'm like, no. I want I want the middle size. We have a taxonomy. It was invented by McDonald's: small, medium, and large. And that's what we're going to go with. Don't correct me. I'm the customer. Hate Starbucks and Chick-fil-A. Any questions about segmenting, targeting, positioning? All right. So you have a critical thinking assignment. You have a week to do that. It's on D2L. Be sure and look at that. Um, consider all the stuff that we talked about in terms of consumer behavior versus organizational behavior. Um, and then we will talk about new products, I think, on Tuesday, and then have the second exam on Thursday, so you won't have to come to class next Thursday. So I'll see you on Tuesday. On Thursday, you'll have class time to do the exam.
If you have any questions, be sure. And the easiest way to do it is to text me. I like texting. I speak to 120 characters or less. Um, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. Have a good morning. If you feel cheated because I'm letting you go 10 minutes early, you let me know and we'll stay late on Tuesday. I'll keep you 10 minutes over.